You rock into a headshot's production. It's something about the girl that just makes my head wanna twirl. Oh, you got me want to tell all them other girls. There's nothing else better on this world. The moment I seen her, I was in shock. A minute wait hold on family all right there we go we're back had to get that sound together fam had to get that sound again my face is ashy as hell damn uh, you know i got my early show ashiness going on right now how's everybody doing how is everybody doing let me do some let me let everybody know that i am um, hold on I'm live right now on Twitter. Hold on one second, family. We are live right here on Ustream. Hold on one second. One second. Let me get in the chat room one second. All right, I'm just making a little tweet to let everybody know we're on. If you're not following me, follow me on Twitter at Tariq Nasheed. Ah. So it's 7.14 on the West Coast. I'm here. I just hopped out of the shower and everything. My face is mad ashy. I didn't get a chance to put any um, moisturizer on my face, but I'm here chilling for this nice Memorial Day weekend. Let me see who is up off in this chat room. If you can't see me, 
Refresh your page. Killing for this. Whoop. If you cannot see me, refresh your page. Let me see who's in the chat. It's hot as hell down in my office, too. One second. And then we're going to get the phone lines lit up in a minute, too. Again, I ran on downstairs to get everything cracking on time. We got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight, family. We got a lot to talk about. We we got, what, 500 people in the room, over 500. So it's going to be packed. We, we're definitely going to get over 1,000 people tonight. Possibly 2,000. We came close to 2,000 a couple of weeks ago. Right here live on the Ustream channel. And for those who are not knowing, y'all need to check out TarikaLeap.com. That's where you can get your gear game together. That is at TarikaLeap.com. We got a lot to talk about tonight, family. We got to talk about the Mark Cuban, Stephen A. Smith story. We'll talk about that very briefly. That's like almost an afterthought right now. We also got to talk about, let me get my screen together here. We got to talk about the Elliot Roger situation, the, uh, the mass shooter. I call him the killer simp. We got to talk about that. We also got to talk about the Mayweather T.I. fight. I think it was last night up in Vegas. Floyd Mayweather Jr. and rapper T.I. got into a little scrap at a fat burger. Hold on. Uh, drop my pen. Uh, at a fat burger in Vegas. So we got to touch on all that stuff. A lot of stuff we got to hit on tonight. Okay, who the hell is this? People already calling up. Hold on one second. This is one of my manufacturers. Hold on one second. They always... I hate to conduct business like this on um, while I'm doing a live show. Who's that at my door? Who's at my door? Must be my nephew. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. All right. Hopefully it gets cooler down here. I'm in my office and for some reason it's hot as hell. Say 50 said Floyd got punched. We got to talk about 52 because 50, 50 Cent's baby's mom is really airing him out heavy. She did a video uh, or an interview. I saw an interview she did with Ryan Cameron down in um, Atlanta. Just really throwing a lot of shade on Fifth. So I like to hear Fifth retort from that. All right, people are coming on in the room. But yeah, 50 just saying stuff to be saying stuff. 50, he, he needs to address what's going on with his baby's mom. Because I'm looking at 50 like, okay, man. Because he was talking, you know, I didn't see exactly what he said about Floyd Mayweather. But I'm like, 50, you better handle the baby mom situation. Because she's talking real reckless. If you dig? But, oh, we got so much to talk about. Ryan is my dude. I like Ryan Cameron. Ryan Cameron is a good dude. I, I, um, I was on, um, they interviewed me a few times back in the day when my books first came out. Alexander Hitchens, you say, now you're trying to talk greasy. You say, is this a gossip show? We're not talking about gossip. We're talking about facts. We're talking about facts. Alexander Bitchens. Since you want to talk slick, nobody's talking about conjecture. We're talking about things that have actually happened. You dig? What's up, a lot of body? How are you? Shout out to Kim and Kanye. They got married. Shout out to them. But... 
Yeah, 50 didn't go to his son's graduation. I'm pretty sure the mom is salting the dude and, and saying real slick stuff. And, yeah, I'm pretty sure the mom is doing some real slick stuff. And I didn't know that woman had, like, other kids like that, too. So, you know, that's a very interesting situation. Oh, yeah. But let's let's first things first. What are we going to talk about first? There's so much to talk about. Let's let's touch on the Stephen A. Smith, Mark Cuban thing first. Let's get on that first. Now, for those who don't know, Mark Cuban, billionaire team owner. Who's he on? Who He owns the Maverick. Who does Mark Cuban own? We're going to talk about Elliot last. We'll get on him in a minute. But Mark Cuban. Now, Mark Cuban did an interview, and the interview went over a lot of people's heads, black folks, the Dallas Mavericks, that I was correct. So what Mark Cuban was doing, he was doing an old white supremacist trick, and I'm not, I'm not saying he's a white supremacist, I'm just saying he's possibly a suspected white supremacist because he did a suspected white supremacist trick. He deflected from systematic white supremacy and white racism by using the minimizing all racism is equal, everybody is prejudiced con game that a lot of people do. He did this whole thing, and when people do this, I'm side-eyeing them. I don't care how liberal they're supposed to act and how down they are supposed to be. When I see people trying to minimize and deflect from systematic white supremacy and you know what you're doing, I'm side-eyeing you and I cannot co-sign you. I don't give a damn how silly some of these other Negroes are because a lot of black folks were like, well, at least Mark Cuban was being real. Mark Cuban said this. He was like talking about Donald Sterling. And it's very interesting that he would come out talking about Donald Sterling and really defending Donald Sterling, trying to pretend that he's not. The whole interview, let's be very clear, that whole thing with Mark Cuban was really him trying to defend um, Donald Sterling. He's trying to defend Donald Sterling. That's what he was doing. So Mark Cuban came out talking about, well, you know, everybody's prejudiced. Everybody's bigoted in some way. Watch those words. Because when people try to act like bigotry and prejudice and systematic racism are interchangeable, they're deliberately being deceptive. Let me say that again. When people try to make it seem like systematic racism, bigotry, and prejudice are somehow interchangeable, they are deceptively, deliberately trying to be deceptive. Because they know that it's not the same. They try to pretend that prejudice is the same as systematic racism. And that's the issue that we have with racism in America, is that it's systematic. And, and I can't wait to Hidden Colors 3 come out because we go deep into this stuff. We talk about systematic racism. But with, with Mark Cuban, he started making these jive-ass comparisons talking about, well, hey, man, we're all prejudiced. Everybody's prejudiced. If I see a black guy with a hoodie Walk down the street late at night, I'm going to walk to the other side of the street. And if I see a white guy with tattoos and a bald head, I'm going to walk to the other side of the street. So, hey, you know, prejudice is, you know. So that bullshit false comparative narrative. And uh, he, he did that, and a lot of people called him out on it. A lot of people called him out on it. Like, Mark, okay, you're not fooling us, Mark. Now, some people went along with it, but... A lot of people called him out on that because that whole hoodie thing was, it sounded like a low-key reference to Trayvon Martin, and he basically apologized to the family because that whole thing about if you see a black kid with a hoodie, that doesn't automatically make him a criminal. I mean, hell, um, Trayvon Martin had on a hoodie. He wasn't a criminal, and he was targeted, and he was killed, and legally killed because of systematic white supremacy. You understand that? And comparing a black kid with a hoodie to a skinhead, basically, a dude with a bunch of tattoos and a bald head, two different things. So, again, but again, Mark Cuban, his whole thing was basically trying to defend Donald Sterling. That's what he was trying to do. 
Because again, these guys, and that's the problem with systematic white supremacy, is that other people in the dominant society will try to take or create sanctuary for these white supremacists that would hear. And that's the problem. You try to coddle and and protect these known white supremacists. Now, after Mark Cuban said we what he had to say, the coon train started rolling. Okay? The coon train ran off the tracks. Let's just be real. And the a person who bought a first class ticket to the coon train was Stephen A. Smith. And we put Stephen A. Smith on the coon train already. On the satire coon train that we have. We put him on the coon train. And, you know, I want to like Stephen A. Smith. You know, I don't think Stephen A. Smith is a bad guy. I still don't think Stephen A. Smith is a bad guy. He's not a bad guy. He's not. But Stephen A. Smith, and this is what he said. Stephen was like, oh, I, I agree. I agree with Mark Cuban and... Then he did the old, well, we blacks got to get it together. We got to present ourselves a certain way. Like, oh, fuck. Oh, I shook my head. He's doing the same old, well, if we just act right, white folks will stop being racist towards us. If we just dress a little better. Oh, man, look, people, when you say that, man, you ain't fooling nobody. You're not fooling nobody. Oh, look, look, black folks, don't let any other black person tell you that it's about what you wear. All this bullshit, and what people do, they make a very extreme comparison. If you go to a job interview with your pants sagging and your hat backwards, you ain't gonna get a job. Well, who's doing that? Let's, let's just be real. Black folks got sense enough to not go to a goddamn job interview dressed like you know, they're in the hood or they're in a rap video. Black folks know better than that. So to try to minimize black unemployment by just saying we ain't dressing right, that's disingenuous. And you should be called out for that. You should be called out for that. All these black people are not unemployed because they're sagging and they're wearing their hats to the back. That's not why they're unemployed. Let's be very clear. Because you got job. they've done studies that shows that if a person's name sounds black, their application don't even get looked at. Don't it doesn't even matter. I saw a story today that showed that half of um, all black graduates from college are unemployed. Half of black college graduates right now are unemployed. So please miss me with that whole we ain't dressing right bullshit. Because that's a cop out. And when I see black folks do it, just basically say, hey, look, black folks, I, I, I don't want to lose my job. So I got to say what, what white people want to hear. Just say that, Stephen A. Smith, and tell him I said it too. Just say that. Hey, look, the, the all the wealth and the resources and the jobs are here. I'm not going to really ride out for the black folks because y'all ain't got nothing to really hold me down. I can't put myself on the line for the black folks. The jobs and the wealth and the resources is over here. So I'm going to say what these people want to hear. Just say that. Because people talking about all these other actors and stuff. I'm not going to name everybody. But there's a lot of people came out trying to defend not not just Donald Sterling, but Mark Cuban. And when, when black folks do it, these are black people who are trying to keep their jobs. They're black people who are simply trying to keep their jobs. They know that they have to say certain things in order to stay employed by the dominant society. And that's a very sad way to live. You got to say stuff that you really don't mean. You don't believe that stuff. Don't think for a minute. I don't think Stephen A. Smith believes that bullshit. Because even he said, I'm dressed in a suit and I get discriminated against. So he knows the deal. And brother, shout out to Michael Eric Dyson. Michael Eric Dyson went on his show and gave his ass that work. Michael Eric Dyson gave him that work. So, yeah, Michael Eric Dyson shut his whole shit down. Yeah, Michael Eric Dyson got in him. But it's just sad. I want to say this to younger black males. Don't look at cats who are riding the coon train, who are 
buck dancing for a job. Don't look at that as something that you think you have to do. The name of the game is not to conform to systematic white supremacy. That's not how you're supposed to live. You're not supposed to kind of conform to this nonsense. You should work to protect yourself against it and to remove that system and replace it with a system of justice. That's your goal. I'm not about to sit up here and conform and tell other black people to conform and just don't wear a hoodie and don't walk around at night. And that's not justice. How about stop practicing systematic white supremacy? How about stop being racist? Let's try that on. Because black folks keep running around on this hamster wheel trying to do things that's not going to seem bad in light of the dominant society. Look, the president, you can be president and they can still call you nigger. Look at the dude out there, the police commissioner in New Hampshire. Old white man out there, police commissioner, Barack Obama's a nigger and I ain't going to apologize. So there's nothing you can really do. Stop running on that hamster wheel. Just be the best you can be. Stack your money up. Let's create an economic base so that nonsense won't affect us. You dig what I'm saying? So just stop giving up your integrity. And I, I, I hate to see young black folks look at that because that, that messes with their esteem. They look at that as like, damn, man, is that what I got to do when I grow up? Young black people know an ass-kissing Negro when they see one. We touch on that in Hidden Colors 3, too, by the way. I can't wait to Hidden Colors 3 come out. Oh, yeah, the whole hoodie thing. And, and what's very interesting about the whole, oh, we got to watch out for the blacks in the hoodies and all this old stuff. Well, you instead of watching out for some innocent black person in a hoodie, you need to be looking out for the crazy, lonely white kid in the BMW. That's who you need to be looking out for, like this goddamn idiot, Elliot Rogers. That's who you need to look out for. That's who Mark Cuban need to cross the street for. Cross the street from him, for him, Mark, um, Mark Cuban. Because you crossing the street for the wrong people. You understand what I'm saying? See, the thing is, and not only that, y'all so busy looking at some innocent black kid who ain't doing nothing to no goddamn body, and this fool is making videos telling you what the fuck he's going to do to folks. This crazy little white boy is out here just doing hundreds of videos talking crazy about what he's going to do. Crazy as fucking cat shit. Talking like a lunatic all over the internet and nobody bats an eye on this fool. He's stalking people all on YouTube. But you looking at the cat over there in the hoodie. See, we got to stop. Y'all got to stop playing these games here. This Elliot dude He's writing out manifestos. He's on message boards with his real name, talking crazy. I mean, this dude detailed everything. Hammer, hey, we're talking about a guy named um, um, Elliot Rogers. You better pick up on your stories, man. This has been all over the news. A guy out here named Elliot Rogers, a white cat out here who uh, did a mass shooting, did a drive-by. And I, I saw this story the other um, yesterday morning. It was like a drive-by in Santa Barbara. I'm like, first, I knew it wasn't no brothers. because brothers, well, First, brothers don't do drive-bys no more because you know, that was only down in South Central during the crack epidemic and the crack era. So brothers out here ain't doing that shit. So I knew it wasn't no brothers. And I'm like, damn, what the essays doing up there? That didn't sound right. It just, the story didn't sound right. I'm like, the essays don't even get down like that. So that story sounded real weird. And then they said it, and they showed the guy's picture and everything. So a guy named Elliot Rogers, he, he, he's the son of the Hunger Games director, the guy who directed, or he was the assistant director of the Hunger Games. He's his son. Well-off kid. He shot, well, he killed three house guests, three of his uh, people, some people who were staying with him. He killed three dudes. Then he went out and started doing drive-by shootings on women. Yeah, he was born in Britain. And th this is another thing, too, and I said this on Twitter. Whenever 
a black person is accused of murder. It's never about him as an individual. It's never about, hey, maybe that motherfucker's crazy. It's never you never hear anyone talk about the mindset, the mind state. Was he on drugs? Was he mentally ill? Was he schizophrenic? You never hear that about a black murder suspect ever. No matter how crazy they are, you never hear that. If a black person is accused of murder or any kind of crime, usually people start talking about and blaming black culture. All black people are blamed for whatever some random black person gets into. Just like Chicago. Now, Chicago, most black people don't live in Chicago, and most of the crime in Chicago is really in the same four neighborhoods out there. All black people in America are blamed for the same crimes that go on in Chicago. All black people are blamed for that. It's like this black culture thing. But when a person in the dominant society, especially in the dominant white society, when they commit murder, you the, the first three things you hear, you hear three deflections. Number one, it's never about white culture, ever, ever, ever. They never go into the ethnicity, ever. As a matter of fact, the first thing they do is deny the whiteness. They'll find out his religion or they'll find out what other little piece of ethnicity that's there and then use that to take away from the whiteness. That's number one. They say, well, he ain't really white. He's mixed. Well, so Donald Sterling, he's not white. He's Jewish. Or the Boston Bombers, they're not white. They're Muslim. That's number one. They'll immediately deny the whiteness, number one, or find some type of thing to hide, the, to hide around. That's number one. They go out of their way to start talking about he's Asian and all this. Now, this dude ain't Asian, by the way. Elliot was white. And I'm just saying this, this is his own words because that's, so, that's one of the reasons why he went down like that and did all that stuff. I'll get on that in a minute. And, oh, yeah, another thing with George Zimmerman. Oh, yeah, he wasn't white. He's Hispanic. Oh, he's Eurasian. Stop. All of these people are classified as white. They're legally classified as white. They're socially conditioned as white. Culturally, they think like white supremacists, as a matter of fact. And all white people don't think like white supremacists, but culturally, a lot of those killers, culturally, they think like white supremacists. Now, the second thing they will say to deflect, they'll say, well, he's mentally ill. He has affluenza. That's a new thing that they're trying to come up with. Saying that a person has affluenza, meaning as an affluent white person, they've been conditioned to have privileges and think that they can get away with something without any kind of repercussions, and that's a mental illness within itself. They have extreme narcissism. They come up with all of these bullshit-ass terms. You think I'm playing? Affluenza is a real phenomenon that they're trying... They, they use that in courtrooms. I'm telling you, it sounds like I'm making it up. They are going to courtrooms talking about motherfucker got affluenza, meaning that he's so used to getting everything he wants, it created a mental illness in him. They're using that as an excuse. You don't see, we don't get no damn affluenza. Um, look that up if you think I'm playing. It's called affluenza. They are using that in courtrooms for rich white kids who go on shooting sprees. They're coming up with excuses for them. It's not influenza. They call it affluenza. They're making it seem like being affluent and then being a killer is like a disease and you couldn't really help yourself because of the way you were conditioned. I'm, you Look it up if you think I ain't real. They, they're trying to push that nonsense. So and, and also, the third thing they do when one of these guys go out here and they kill people, they'll blame it on the government. They say, oh, this is an MK Ultra. Oh, this is a government conspiracy. Oh, this was the Obama administration. They... They did a CIA operation so they can try to take our guns. They always use those same excuses for all of those 
um, um, white mass murderers. You dig? But there's some people trying to say that this Elliot guy, because his mother is Asian and his dad is white, well, he's not, he's not white, he's, he's mixed. He's, first of all, he doesn't identify with being Asian. Legally, he's classified as white. Legally, he's classified, and culturally, this guy, and, and, and socially, this guy you know, lives like a white person. He, I'm, I'm going by his own admissions. Not a, I mean, shit, it is what it is. <laughs> Even by his own admission, he's on message boards talking about, hey, why does this dude get the girl? He's not even as white as me. He's saying stuff like that. And they're trying to make it seem like he's Asian. He don't like Asians. If I'm, see, the thing with him, because you can't really lie on this guy because he's spoken so much on the Internet. He's left so many um, um, paper trails and Internet trails. He don't claim Asian. Not only don't Asian claim him, he shits on Asian, Asians. If you read some of the things he said online, he's like, you Asians ain't shit. And I mean, he don't like Asians, nobody except white people. So this dude was a white supremacist because he was talking crazy. And let me say this. When the story first broke yesterday morning, when the story first broke, Nobody knew too much about what was going on. The story broke yesterday morning. And y'all go back and look at some of my tweets. The only thing, they had a couple of YouTube videos of the guy. And I saw one YouTube video. He was talking about how he deserved. He got, he's like, man, I don't know why I can't get women. Why the women don't want to get with me. Because I got... A BM, I got a BMW. I want a blonde. I deserve. And I'm picking up all, on all of these words he's saying. Because I watched the first video that was circulating. And again, the manifesto, none of that stuff was out yet. The manifesto came out later yesterday evening. So I'm looking at the video and I said, wait a minute. This dude... I bet you this shit is racially motivated with this dude because the shit, the shit he's saying, I'm like, this. I bet this is racially motivated. I even tweeted that. Go back and look at my tweets from yesterday morning, early afternoon, around 11, something like that. I was like, hey, y'all, I bet this is racially motivated. Just on, just on this video, some of the code words this dude is saying. Now, people were like going in on me like, oh, no, that don't make no sense. Go back and look at Twitter. People were like, that don't make no sense. Why would it be racial? What? He didn't shoot no black person. I'm saying, no, 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 no. That ain't it. That ain't it. Y'all missing the point. Just it just sounds like there was a racial motivation. Oh no, that don't make no sense. That crazy. People were just mad at me for saying that. People were mad at me for saying that. But I'm like, y'all not picking up on this dude's words. I'm picking up on his little code words. I'm picking up on his code words when cats start talking about what they deserve and. And come on, I want a blonde, and I got this. I already know what he's talking about. I already know what he's talking about. I'm like, okay, he's mad that his white privilege ain't working. That's what that's white privilege talk. When dudes start talking about all the fly shit they got and how they got it popping, and the women ain't choosing because they deserve to be chosen up on that. That's some white privilege shit talking. Now he's because that's white supremacist talk. So I'm like, okay, when they're talking like that, I said, let me, let, I, I want to dig deeper and see what's going on with this dude. So then stories start coming out about him posting up on message boards, not just being misogynistic, but making racial comments. I said, oh, really? Now we getting somewhere. Now we getting somewhere. Then people start to say, oh shit, this Nick Tariq might be on to something. So now we're getting somewhere. He's He's mad that a brother, he saw a black dude with a whole bunch of fine white women, and he got mad. Oh, there we go. There we go. Now we're getting to the root of what's happening. Then, later on that evening, the manifesto came out, and that just verified everything right there. That verified everything. He went in on that manifesto. He That was like a deathbed confession. And, and I'm going to talk about that manifesto. 
And, and basically the gist of what he was saying, because there was a, a white lady who was a feminist who was arguing about me talking about, well, this is race has nothing to do with it. He was just misogynist. He hated women. And that's why he did it. I said, ma'am, you're just trying to make it about race. I'm like, ma'am, nobody's denying the misogynistic, you know, mindset he had. But why did he hate women? We got to go deeper than that. Yeah, he was misogynistic. But why? And then she hit me back up. It, it, he just was. He hated women just because he did. And I'm like, man, that's not a real answer. That's not a real answer. Well, just just like, oh yeah, you throw you throw that ma'am on him because that's going to defuse him. So now now you got to get real calm on him. So she was like, well, just there's white people who just happen to hate black people. No, there's a reason why some white people hate black people. It's not just just because. There's a lot of reasons. Jealousy, fear of genetic survival. There's a whole bunch of reasons. So that's why we try to get into the reasons of it. And then she started to deflect on some other bullshit because she lost the argument. But it goes beyond just him being misogynistic because now a lot of the white feminists, they're using that as like a, an example. They're going to try to, I don't know if they're going to try to get some more money or whatever, but they're using this as a example of misogynistic, the misogynistic mindset. And my thing is, you're not looking into it deeper. We know that he didn't like women, but why? Let's go deeper. We got to go deeper. And we're going to go deeper tonight. I'm going I'm to explain why I knew this dude was racially motivated. People, when it comes to systematic white supremacy, people don't want to deal with that. Because then you're going to open up a Pandora's box. So people want to deal with affluenza. He has Asperger's disease. He's mentally ill. It's the guns. They're talking about everything except what he was saying in those, those tapes and in those manifestos. They're not dealing with what this motherfucker was saying. I'm looking at what he was saying. I'm looking at directly at what he's saying. First, I, I could read between the lines. Now... He confirmed basically what his motivation was. If you want to get down with it, the problem is a lot of people don't want to deal with the, the systematic white supremacist mindset that this guy had. Let, let's just let's break it down. This guy classified himself as white. All this stuff about him being Asian and all that stop, stop, because we're not getting to the root of it. And that's a way to deflect. He not only looked at himself as a white person culturally, culturally and socially, but he thought being a white person, he was superior to all other non-whites. And he kept using the term inferior. If you look at the stuff he was saying, he was like, I saw a black dude and I'm like, he was an ugly, inferior black boy. Why did he get the girls? Y'all notice that? He kept saying stuff like that. He kept saying how inferior black the black boy is, or the he saw a black dude with a whole bunch of beautiful blonde white women, and why does he get to do that? He deserve I deserve them. Okay, yeah, Dre, you gotta go, fam. Okay, because Dre, we gotta we got a, a supremacist up in here. We gotta get Dre up out of here. Let me let me get Diva. Make Diva a mod real quick so I don't we don't get sidetracked. But but like I said, and this is a reason why I talk about not just relationships. I talk about relationships in race because there's a correlation. What's up, Jamil? How are you, love? There is a correlation between relationships and race. There is a correlation between relationships and race. A direct correlation. And this guy, Elliot, was on different message boards. He was on one particular site called PUA Hate. Now, PUA Hate is a website. I guess they talk about dating gurus and pickup artists. Now, they talk about me on that website a lot. They, they've taken the site down. But that website, they got a, if you Google PUA hate and Tariq Nasi, you'll see there's a whole bunch of shit they would say about me on that site because, you know, I write relationship, I write relationship books. So they discussed a, a lot of my stuff on that website. And I know the mindset of those dudes. A lot of those dudes, when they talk about relationships and dating or whatever, there's a lot of solo racism 
beneath that. You dig? There's a lot of subtle racism beneath that. So I know how these dudes think. That's why I wasn't... Yeah, they do hate on me on that website. And they say like a little, a lot of little racial shit about me on that website. So I already know the mindset that those guys have. I already know the mindset. I already know the mindset of those dudes on that website. There's a lot of dudes who are like a lot of insecure, little secret white supremacists on that site. And when it comes to dating and relationships, they feel like, okay, this black person, a black guy with game, that's a threat to me. It's that type of mentality. It's like a black guy with game is it's like threatening to them to a certain degree. And with this Elliot guy, he kept talking about how he deserved to be with these beautiful blonde white women. He kept making references on in the manifesto, on these different message boards. He keeps talking about how he it upsets him when he sees a non-white person with a beautiful blonde white woman. He saw an, an Indian dude with a white woman. It made him upset. And I'm saying that's his motivation. That's his motivation because what he's saying is this. If you look at the manifesto and look at all the racial comments, what he's saying is this. He's saying, look, I'm white. I'm well off. I got it going on. I got a BMW. My dad is a famous white director. I'm privileged. I got $300 shades because I saw a video he had on some shades. He's bragging about his shades. I got $300 shades. I got it going on. I got it popping. You no, know, no, and that's another thing. You say, how could he could have just been a trick? No, see, because it wasn't just about getting sex. That wasn't it. That's the thing. He was like, yeah, I'm a virgin, but it ain't about just sex with him. See, that's the thing. A lot of people say that if he's a virgin, he could have just went and tricked his money off, which he could have, but it's not about that because the insecurity would still be there. It, it was never about just sex with this dude. It was never about sex whatsoever. It was about the power with this dude. He was looking at another nigga's bedroom skills. That's the thing. It wasn't about just sex. He could have just went down to Hollywood went to a club and popped a few bottles and just did some name dropping, go around Hollywood saying, hey, my dad is the, the director of Hunger Games. Bam, you get ass like that just off GP. It was the power. That It was the power with this dude. It was all about power. And he saw that these people who were supposed to be powerless, getting more play than him, that was fucking with him. That was eating him alive. Look at the words he was saying. He's seeing these black dudes who are inferior, his words. It was that whole Donald Sterling thing. This is Donald Sterling Jr. He's Donald Sterling Jr. He kept talking about, man, these inferior black guys, they're ugly and inferior. Why do they get the women and I don't? What he's saying is I have all of this privilege and I'm in a, I'm in the, I'm a white guy, I got a car, I got $300 glasses, I got all this, these private jets and this wealth and the resources, and you still, these women, you want to go with those guys and they're inferior to me. They're supposed to be inferior. Life ain't fair. He kept saying stuff like, life isn't fair. Listen to his words. Y'all notice that? Go look at some of the video he's saying. He kept saying, life ain't fair. Dude, you got everything. You got everything. Flights, jets, cars, privilege, and he's saying life ain't fair. Go back. Let's, let's go back. Donald Sterling is a billionaire. Donald Sterling is a multi-billionaire. He's on Barbara Walters. What's that Barbara Walters he was on? Was it Barbara Walters who interviewed him? 
Who interviewed? No, 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 it wasn't Barbara Walters. It was Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper. Donald Sterling, billionaire, on Anderson Cooper talking about, hey, man, B. Stiviano was around those black guys. I was jealous. You're a billionaire, white guy, jealous of black dudes. Think about that, man. Think about that. Because that mindset is very prevalent out here. And this is something that we don't deal with when it comes to systematic racism. We don't deal with that aspect of it. We always look at it because people put it on us like something is wrong with the black folks. A lot of black people are scared to challenge systematic white supremacy racism. So they just go along with the hell. We just got to dress better. We, they go along with that silly nonsense. But the thing is with, with Elliot, he kept saying I have all of this stuff. I'm a great guy. I go on private flights. I go, I'm at the golf course. I got nice car, money. Why them? Why are they, these beautiful blonde white women, getting with those guys? That's all this shit is about. That's all it was about. And his mindset as a white supremacist, he's thinking, okay, look, we've done everything to systematically disenfranchise these guys, these ugly, inferior black guys. We've done everything to disenfranchise these guys. We've demonized them as a society. We've put them in prison. We've economically deprived them. We've educationally deprived them. We've made them martyrs. We, we, we've marginalized them. We've demonized them. And our women are still going for them. Damn it. That's what he was really trying to say. He was trying his best to articulate that. That's what he was really trying to say. He said it in so many words. He actually said it in so many words. So his solution was this. Well, look, because remember, racism is all about survival. It's all about survival. So he's like, well, look, if we, if y'all gonna keep dating these guys, these black dudes, we've done everything we could to these black dudes to make them undesirable. We've done everything single thing imaginable to make these black men undesirable. We can't do any more to them. We've done everything to make you not like these dudes. We call them names. We put them in movies as inferior. My dad puts them in movies as inferior. We show them as inferior. We show them on the news as inferior. Everything we try to do, we try to demonize them and make us look as desirable as possible, and you still want to be with them. So there's nothing else we can do to those black dudes. But I can do something to these women. I can do something to the women. Since they're going to choose these guys, and um, th this is his mindset. This is his mindset. Since I can't do anything to them black guys to make you not like them, I can do something to you. Let me get my gun. I can do something to you, white women. Blonde white women. I can do something to you. Because I can't go out here shooting these brothers. They might shoot me back. So I can't run up on them with a gun. They might get at me. So I can do something to these white women. I can do something to them for choosing these brothers and not me and I deserve it and I got all the I got the BMWs and I got the private jets and I got the privileges and y'all still won't get me you're still getting those black guys well I got something that's equal to the black guy he got that dick I got this black gun that was the motivation for him doing that we can talk about misogyny but look at what this dude was really saying Look at what this dude was really, really saying. Because everything about this dude was about how he was, it just really pissed him off to see white chicks with black dudes. Why, why are they getting them? I mean, you look at this dude's videos, it's like tearing him up inside. That white entitlement, that white privilege was killing him, that it wasn't working. It wasn't working for him. That's the thing. And he felt powerless because 
he felt, okay, I got all of these privileges. I, d I have everything you could do. Why don't you like me? <laughs> you, you, I got all of this and you still with them? I can't do anymore. I don't know what to do. That's what that was about. The dude felt powerless compared to the black male. The dude felt powerless compared to the black male. And let me tell you something. That's the motivation for systematic racism right there. If you study him, if you study this guy, that's the motivation for systematic racism right there. That black male sexuality. Hey, this is why I talk about relationships and I tie in race because there's a direct correlation between all that. There's a direct correlation between all that. All this stuff they're talking about, he was mentally ill, he had a mental meltdown. This motherfucker did not have a mental meltdown. Let's be very clear. He calmly made videos. He calmly wrote a manifesto. He planned all of this stuff out, all right? Wasn't like he just snapped one day. This was something that was planned out. He was very meticulous about this. This was very meticulous. And this is something that the dominant society, the, you have to discuss the negative effects of systematic white supremacy and the negative repercussions that it, it causes on people in the dominant society. Because you're trying to live up to a, a, a myth. You're trying to live up to a fallacy. You're trying to live up to a fallacy that because I have European descent, I'm supposed to be superior over these group of people. Unfortunately, too many people in our society think like that. And that's the sickness. And that's something that nobody never wants to address in this country openly. Nobody wants to address this. That's the problem with racism in this country. Nobody's talking about it from the perspective of systematic white supremacy, which is the only way racism that we have that's systematic. So it's real heavy. It's real heavy, but again, the guy, he felt powerless. What, what Joe Rogan said it, he said the biggest fear is this woman leaving him to fuck a big black dude with a black... Oh, Joe Rogan said his biggest fear is that. That's funny. Some dudes will be very honest with it. Some dudes will be very honest. Let's get deep with that because you know what? We're the white women. We got white ladies in here. Where are the white women in here? Because there are a lot of white women to tell you if she's honest. But when if a white woman was in a relationship or had a, any kind of sexual relationship with a black dude, a lot of white dudes trip on white women when they get down like that. White dudes do not like that. They don't like the fact that a woman they're dating or have dated was sexual with a black dude. White dudes do not fuck with white women when they find that out, for the most part. And, and that's something that a lot of folks don't want to talk about. Where uh, We got any white brothers and sisters in here? People got to talk about these sexual taboos that are seeped in race in this country. Oh, yeah, they got all types of names. They call them mud sharks and all that. They get very antagonistic towards white women like that. Oh, yeah, a lot of white women lie about it. And that's another thing. See, the thing is, and let's let's go deeper about the whole college thing, because, see, in college, you have to understand this. And this, this is the thing that was really fucking with this Elliot dude. See, he's in college. He keeps talking about all those hot women in college not getting with him because basically they were getting with the brothers. And if you notice on many college campuses, there are a lot of racial pranks on a lot of college campuses. You got like, you know, white dudes hanging up black dolls with nooses and racial spray paint. There's a lot of stuff that goes on with racial undertones. And this Elliot dude was upset. He's in college. All these beautiful blonde women 
not getting with him. Because what happens is that when a lot of white women, and brothers know what I'm talking about, this is something that's never really talked about, but a lot of white women get very experimental when they go to college. Brothers who go to college, especially if you've gone to like a mixed race college, or even if it wasn't a mixed race college, if you were the only brother there, brothers know you get a lot of play from the white women at these colleges because they have left whatever small town they were from. So these... White women, they they hear these negative stories about brothers, about, you know, all these brothers who are thugs and crackheads and all that. And then they go to college and they meet a brother who looks decent, brother well-built, articulate. They, white women start choosing. White women start choosing heavy. Let, let, this is real. So when they go to college, it's on and popping. I'm telling you, dude, brothers know all my brothers who went to college. They know as them. As them. They get real experimental in college. You dig? They choose heavy in college. As Sarah Palin. <laughs> as Sarah Palin. They, they get all conservative later on down the line. Yeah, they get conservative later, but in college, it's on and popping. You, you dig? So, a lot of these dudes, these little dudes who are raised to be white supremacists, they go to college and see all this going down. They're like, hey, it's fucking with them a little bit. Oh, yeah, ask Barbara Walters. <laughs> You dig? So, this dude, uh, Elliot, he's seeing all this. These brothers going up in here in these colleges eating ramen noodles, but they banging out all the blondes up there. You know that shit was tearing his ass up. He didn't know what to do. Brothers up there in Santa Barbara knocking them out, eating ramen noodles, probably don't even have a car, riding a bike to, to class, getting all the women. And he's like, fuck, he's inferior. I got a BMW. Somebody's going to die. I'm shooting somebody. So that's something that has to be discussed. That's a real big fear. That's a real big fear. And, and people are going for this, people in the dominant society are trying to live up to a false narrative of you know, white supremacy. It's systematic, but it's based on a false narrative. You're not superior because you're from Europe. That makes no sense when you look at it. So, so we, we never had a real dialogue about race in this country. The show is being recorded. And that's the thing, man. The country has so much potential, but we got to talk about race realistically. We in here heavy. Where are my white brothers and sisters? All my white brothers and sisters, press three. All my white brothers and sisters in here, press three. Let me know you in here. Let me know you in here. If you're, you're a Caucasian lady or gentleman, press three. I know you're in here. Don't be afraid. We're family. We're family. I know you're in here. Don't be scared. I know we ain't having a million man march. Everybody in, in here ain't black. Because I asked what my white brothers and sisters in y'all. Y'all call up when y'all get mad enough. Like Denise. Y'all call up. You get mad enough, you'll call up. Hello? <laughs> this is hogwash. <laughs> y'all get mad enough, then you'll call up. You'll come out the shadows then. What's up, Marzina? You, um... Your, your Caucasian, call up Marzina, let's de-cook your ass ain't right? <laughs> de-cook, please. All right, well, where are my, my white brothers and sisters? I want y'all to call up. The number is 818, let me fix it, 818-850-5404. Eight one eight eight five zero five four zero four. 
Let's see who we got. What's up? Who's calling? What's going on, Tyree? What's up, man? Who is this? If you have, like, type 1.5. All right, there you <laughs> this go. is Lose from D.C., Tyree. There you go, man. What's on your mind, fam? Hey, I got a question. Look, first thing first, man, can you please put Tommy Sario on uh, the coon train, please? What do you do? Man, look, listen to his show. That, that's all you got to do. You have to pick which one you want to put him on there for. Because <laughs> there's so many, man. He didn't lost his mind, man. He going crazy, man. You got to put him on a train, cone train. I'm going to put him on. Yeah. That's first thing. Yeah. Second thing, man. I, hey, I got a question, man. Go ahead. You know what I'm saying? We, we talking about this white supremacy and everything, and I kind of be getting into arguments with people about this, you know. Right. When you sit in a, a, a an eight or nine bedroom house, you know what I'm saying, with about six, seven cars out there, you know, how are you for your community when most of your money are, you know, is going towards, you know what I'm saying, the people that practice white supremacy? I don't understand that. Can you can you help me figure that out? No, no I don't. I don't understand that question. Now, what, what do you mean now? Well, you know, like for people who, you know, what I'm saying the. Uh, the celebrities or whatever you want to say, right? You know, and they say they're for their people. You know what I'm saying? They, you know, they all about black. You talk about to their people, black people, right? Right. Okay, you say they're for their people, but yeah, but uh, you know, they they sit up in a uh, you know a ten bedroom house, you know, four, five, six cars in the garage, you know, and 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 how how's that you know helping your people? That you know that's helping the people that practice white supremacy, right? I mean, because everything you buy, all the million dollar cars in your home and all, you know, that's going towards the people. How, you know, how, how can you be so greedy? It ain't about greed. I mean, what what are they supposed to do? If you a celebrity or an actor or a basketball player and you got six, seven million dollars, what you supposed to do? I mean, you could start trying to help it. Can we go to Chicago and set up some things? And, set up you know, what? I can understand wait, 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 set up what? Set up what in Chicago? Set up what? I mean, I don't know. It's something you can do. No, 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 no. You got to be very specific because if you don't know, they don't know. So set up what in Chicago? Okay, I'm trying to let you talk. Go ahead. Okay, you got to be very specific. You're like, they could just set up some. I don't know. If you don't know, no. they don't know. Well, set up what in Chicago, I mean, for example? They can open up some businesses there. They can open up some businesses there, you know? Okay. Black owned. Okay. Black owned. Okay, like what? It, Give me an example. Give me an example. Like, what kind of business could um, Michael Jordan uh, or anything? You know, maybe some, uh, some soul food restaurants or um, manufacturing companies, you know? I, I don't know. Clothing okay. stores. I okay. mean, at least it will be black owned, I say. Okay, I mean, now. Okay, business. now. Now. Okay, now my question to you is, why don't you and other black people pull your money together and open up that soul food restaurant and that clothing store? I mean, you know how long that is take? No. Because they can do it overnight. No, well, you can do it overnight. Hell, um, black folks can get down to Myrtle Beach and, and spend all their money there as a group. I'm how much that cost, Terry? How, how much, much that cost? How much does a soul? Whoa, 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 whoa. How much does a soul food restaurant cost? It's not that much money to put a soul food restaurant together, bro. You got to purchase the property first, right? Terry? No, you don't. You rent the property. You can rent or lease the property. Okay, well you got to rent. You got to come up with enough money to rent the property yeah, first, right? Okay, how much you think that is? Let's be real. How much you think that is? I don't know, maybe a uh, 24, 2600 or something. I don't know. You okay. probably got a better 20, idea. 20, okay, uh, let's go with that. 2600 a month. If you can't raise 2600 a month, you slipping. You ain't ready to start no business anyway if you can't raise $2,600 okay. a month. Okay, Terry, why do always seem like you defend these people, bro? Uh, I'm, I'm, def I'm talking about you now. I'm talking about you. How come you can't get twenty six hundred dollars? That's not a lot of money. How come you can't open up a soul food restaurant and make it black owned? You know, that's that's what you. I mean, it's like you wrote. Like no, 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 no. I asked you a question. How come you can't get twenty six hundred dollars a month and open up a black business? I mean, I got a place where I'm living. You know what I'm saying? I'm struggling. Well, if you had a black owned business, you wouldn't be struggling. Okay, I, I see where you're coming from a little bit, Tyree. Don't well, you but why don't you get with other black folks if you're struggling? No, 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 no. If you're struggling, no, 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 no. If you're struggling, bro, how come you haven't gotten with other black people who are struggling too and say, hey, look, let's put a little bit of our money together and let's open up a soul food restaurant in Chicago so we can generate some money? How come you haven't done that? 
I just told you, first of all, I'm trying. I'm barely making it, man. You now, know? why are you barely making so, it? Wait, 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 wait. Why are you barely making it? Why are you? Wait, 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 You got to pay wait, rent. You wait, also bro. need to go out there wait. and purchase the property or wait. something like that. Bro, too. you ain't got to. You can rent the property. You can rent the property, bro. You be, Now, why are you barely making it? How old are you, man? Well, we're, we're renting. I'm 30. <laughs> you're 30 years old. So you don't need, you're too old to be sitting up here talking about I'm barely making it, man. You need to be grinding right now. You're too old for that. I ain't got nothing. You sound like an old hood rat right now. You need to be grinding right now. Like no, no, rat, I'm man. saying you sound like an old hey. hood rat right now. That's what it's old not, chicks on the county sound know, like. That's what. No, no, no. Yeah, listen, yeah. dude, you better listen and shut your goddamn mouth, bro, on some real shit. Chill out and just listen. I'm trying to give you some insight okay, right here, bro. Okay. But, dude, you're 30 years old, so you need to be hustling right now. You, you need to think of some ways that you can generate some money and do things instead of sitting up here talking about you struggling. You should have a, a groove going right now where you ain't struggling. If you're struggling and you're 30 and you ain't got no prospects or no real money coming in or no real career coming in, you've been fucking up. What have you been doing all these 30 years? Okay, look, let me ask you this then. This no, 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 answer, no, 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 answer me, then ask me. No, 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 answer, no, 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 get your ashy ass off my phone, nigga. Just get your ass off my phone. Get out of here, you damn nigga. Just get off my phone. I'm not talking to no male hood rat. I'm not talking to a male hood rat, no 30-year-old nigga talking about he's struggling. I'm not talking to no old-ass fucking male hood rat. I'm struggling. Nigga, you sound like a teen mother. The fuck, you ain't getting no sympathy from me. I'm not giving this nigga a pass. And that's the problem with these bum-ass dudes out here. Dude, don't nobody as a male Want to hear no grown-ass dude, especially no woman. Don't no woman want to hear no grown-ass nigga. I'm struggling. You 30 years old. Talking about what another nigga need to do for you. How come y'all celebrities don't be buying us stuff and giving us? We struggling. I talked about this on my last show. He's a Mitch. You a 30-year-old nigga sound like a hood rat at All-Star Weekend looking for some celebrity to give you something. As a man, that don't work, my dude. As a dude, that don't work. A, a woman can get away with it if she's halfway decent looking. A woman can get a nigga to bang her out and give her a couple of dollars. You don't even have that, nigga. Nobody want to bang that. You a dude. You ain't got no bargaining chips. That whole I'm struggling, that don't work on nobody, dude. You can tell niggas raised by single mothers. That's single mother talk right there. This nigga's been listening to his mama talk about how she's struggling and she goes down to get the Section 8. Oh, I'm, I can't feed my babies. I'm struggling. My check didn't come. So he's used to seeing his mama talk that. And now he's talking that bullshit. That don't work on no dudes. You better get out here and grind. You 30 years old. That's why I asked him. I'm like, dude, what have you been doing for 30 years? What have you been doing for 30 years? No, let me ask you this. No, nigga. You don't ask me nothing. Don't ask me nothing. Get out here and start grinding, my dude. You got to grind. You sitting up in the house talking about you broke and struggling. I, I'm struggling. I ain't got no money. Counting another nigga's money. If they got all this money, they got eight cars, they got a house, then nigga, you sound moist as hell. That nigga sounded moist. And that's what we got a bunch of moist, sugar booty little niggas running around the hood talking like women about what somebody need to, what some other dude need to do for them. You sound retarded. Section 8 niggas. Dusty as hell. See, this is why I get on these dudes. And I, and, and I, I say to the women, 
I'm not as hard on the women because I understand the kind of dudes a lot of you ladies have to deal with. I feel, trust me, ladies, I feel you. I feel you. When you got to deal with the nigga who just called up, just imagine a woman in a relationship with a nigga like that. Do you think a woman is going to feel secure with that nigga? You're doomed if you date him. Some old losing beta male can't get... If you a woman dating him, a, a man talking about what another man should do for him, a woman is going to be like, well, shit, I might as well go fuck the nigga he talking about. What woman is going to date a dude talking about what another man should do for him? Woman is looking at you like, I can, if, if Tariq need to do something for you, I need to go fuck Tariq. You dig what I'm saying? These dudes, man, are on that bullshit. It's a lot of moist, soft booty dudes out here like this, man. And I really feel for a lot of sisters, is this is what you have to go through. This is what you have to date. It's hot as hell down here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you say you don't want to put your, your property on Section 8 because you get this nigga in here. Oh, this old bum-ass nigga, he sound dusty and bummy. This nigga, I, can, I don't even know what the dude looks like. He just sounds dusty and bummy. This nigga sound like he got on old ass hip hop clothes from 1998. Nigga got on an old Pele Pele leather jacket. And some vocal sweatpants. Just some old out of style shit with some dingy braids or something. This nigga just sound old and dusty. Talking old dusty nigga shit that don't nobody want to hear. You 30 and broke. With a P. Miller shirt on. Some niggas should be ashamed of themselves. Because I'm about, I'm, I'm all about, you know, I challenge systematic white supremacy and racism and all that. But I do get on niggas' asses too for being on that dumb shit. That ain't no excuse for somebody to be like him. There's no excuse for anybody to be like this dude. A grown ass man. He's probably older than 30, too, by the way. He's probably older than 30. So this nigga must be sitting up in his mama's house or something. Some old-ass nigga in his mama house. Sneaking in hood rats. I wouldn't, I just couldn't live like that. I can't imagine myself sitting up here 30 at 30. I wrote about my I was on my third or second book at 30. I couldn't do that. Talking about what another nigga should do. That's pathetic. We got off topic a little bit. Well, we're gonna talk about some more stuff. We're still gonna talk about um the Floyd Mayweather situation and um him getting into a fight with T.I. What's up? Who's calling? Yo, what's going on, Tariq? It's uh PJ calling on Palm Beach. What's up, PJ from Palm Beach? What's on your mind, fam? Dude, I'm cracking up on that last call, man, because I know niggas just like that, dude. Damn, man. <laughs> Tell them niggas I said kill yourself. <laughs> this, this niggas are raggedy. Oh man. Some raggedy ass <laughs> niggas out here. That old, oh, that damn dusty. All right, what's on your I mind, see, man? man? What's on your mind? Well, well um, I, I just need some quick advice, man. Um, I'm 20 years old. Yeah. And uh, I'm getting ready to move to Gainesville in the spring for school. Okay. But, and um, I mean, I'm trying to find some ways to make money, but I don't want to really have to grovel and look for a job. Right. Uh, and I was really thinking about starting an online business. I, I was wondering if you had any advice. Uh, why don't you, why, wait, wait, why don't, why don't you start a soul food restaurant with the nigga who just called up? <laughs> 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 call that oh, man, shit. I, I <laughs> call it, call it, <laughs> call it Dusty Plate Soul Food. <laughs> 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 the Dusty Spoon. 
No, but there's a lot of stuff you can do online. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do online. You just got to find out what you're passionate about. That's the main thing. Like, what do you like to do? Some of the things you're passionate about. And um, there's a million things you can do online. Like, what, what do you do as your hobby? What kind of hobby do you have? Well, uh, I've actually been uh, jailbreaking and unlocking people's iPhones since I was 14. Oh, yeah. And I used dude. to do that. Like, little, oh, man. Yeah, I used to do that like, a little top. Yeah, dude. I used to do that like, a little side hustle, but I, you know, I, I kind of detracted away from it. But I was really, I was really thinking about getting back into it because I know a lot of uh, kids on these college campuses will really go for something like that. Yeah. So I don't know if that's really. I'll tell you what else you can do, too. Uh, um, since you're good with the iPhones, I mean, do you know how to actually work the physical phones and all that? Oh yeah, I know. I, I I learned how to take apart a phone, put it back together. Let me tell you what you need to do. Uh, let me tell I, you. Let me tell you exactly a, a good um, job you can do, a business you can start. What you should do, since you're good with those phones, start like an iPhone repair business. Because what happens is that right. a lot of people they break their iPhones, and instead of buying, you know, right. paying all that money to buy a new one, a lot of folks want to get it repaired, yeah. and they don't know how to do that. And there's only a few places that do it. Like, for example, there's a place out here where I live. There's only one place where I live in the whole valley area that fixes the iPhone glasses, like when they break. And I know it stays busy because it's like the only place people can go to unless they won't have to buy a whole new phone. So I would say try something like that. Just just think outside the box as far as things like right. that. You feel me? Wait a minute. Let me get some of these All other right. calls, man. All right. No Thanks, brother. I hate to cut the brother off. I I, I ain't want to waste too much. Niggas in the online bean pie store. Yeah. Yeah, but that that's a real good hustle right there because the place I go to, I see a lot of people trying to get their iPhones, the glasses, it breaks on the phone, and instead of getting a whole new phone, you get a get that shit replaced. And that's a good hustle right there if you're good with phones. Yeah, yeah, you could exactly. My man can put an ad on Craigslist, or you can get a little, um, a little card at the mall and get down like that. Make your own iPhone app, exactly. I got some iPhone, I got some iPhone, not just apps, but I got some video games that I'm getting designed too. Yeah, shout out to brother Sam Greenlee. Sam Sam Greenlee did die recently, and Sam Greenlee was a real dude. What's up, Michelle? You say you struggling? Send me some PayPal. <laughs> What'd you look like? So a woman can at least get away with it. So a woman can at least find a simp. Ah, damn. This nigga trying to nigga call up trying to hustle like a woman. How come niggas ain't giving me nothing? <laughs> nigga, because you got a dick and balls. Why they gonna give dick and balls nothing? Fuck out of here. <laughs> Nigga, you can't even get food stamps for too long with dick and balls. They're like, hey, nigga, enough of the food stamps. Get to grinding. Just society looks at a dude like, hey, man, you better figure out a hustle. Nigga, you better get go holler at Sabir Bay and get you some bootleg DVDs and slang them or something, dude. I mean, sitting up talking about what another nigga should do for you. You sound stupid. Man, what's up, Splash? Yeah, we talked about Elliot Rogers. We talked about that. How many people we got in here? We heavy in the room. Don't forget to check out. We 1,300 in here. We are deep in the room tonight. Shout out to all of y'all people. Don't forget to check out TariqElite.com. That's where you can get the gear. That's at TariqElite.com. Get that gear. Where are the ladies? Let me talk to some of these ladies. Let me talk to some of these ladies. What's up? Who's calling? Hello, Tariq. Hey, what's up, fam? Is this Tariq Nasheed? Nigga. Yeah, what's up, man? I'm calling to uh, to say a little bit about uh, the last brother call up. That you're putting down the old guy. You said I was 30 years old. Yeah, and broke. 30 years old and broke. And uh, hollering about how broke he is. Yeah, what about him? Um, shit, first, I'm 50, bruh. And I've been uh, smoking crack for a long time, man. But I recovered, man. I'm on my way. I mean, true enough, a brother ain't supposed to be 
supposed to be, uh, you know, doing that stuff. Then he can come. I mean, uh, our brother can redeem himself. I know you can. But are you are you you are you begging other men for for money and other men to give you something? No. No, I'm not. All right, then that I ain't got no problem with you. I, I have no problem with you. The problem I have with that dude is that he's thirty, broke, and hollering about what another man should do for him. At least you went and got your own crack and your own pipe. I know you weren't begging nobody for nothing. How you doing now? I'm doing fine, bro. I'm doing fine. I have another issue too, bro. Go ahead. You got on the brothers for the for the section eight. I'm on section eight. I earned mine through the VA. Okay, there you go. That's cool. That's cool in the game. I mean, you you were you, uh, you're a veteran, right? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Well, you are you a veteran? Yes, sir. I am a veteran. No, okay, I can understand that. Now, that I can understand, but I know some niggas who ain't fought no war, ain't been in nobody's army, and sitting up in a damn Section 8 house paying $8 a month. And that's something totally different. You dig? So I can understand your situation. You had a drug issue. How long you been off the pipe? So I've been off the pipe for about five years now. Okay, and that's a good thing. I, I congratulate you on that, brother. I like to see our brothers get it together and... and, and overcome those demons and I, and I hope everything works out for you too but uh, what you doing with yourself now brother how you staying busy actually i'm in a uh, va program that's trying to put me on permanent you know the vets come with a lot of perks i'm in one of those programs that uh that they test you twice a week keep you clean and make sure you're okay to get hired yes indeed oh i'm on down for that that's cool in the gang man so yeah, hey but you your situation is is a unique situation but it ain't like that other dude he ain't done shit so he ain't at liberty to talk about what somebody should do for him so that's why i got in his ass anyway but anyway but thanks all right. thanks for the call fam all right thanks for picking up yes indeed all right Hey, shout out to that brother. He put that pipe down and put the pipe behind him. All right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Where are the ladies at? No, I, I, I rock with the veterans because a lot of brothers, they've gone to war, and I got much love for them. I heard about that. What's that with Jaden Smith dressed like a he was a in a white bunny rabbit outfit? What the hell was he doing? Yeah, Jaden Smith was in a bunny rabbit outfit or something. A Batman. It was some kind of outfit he was walking around in. I'm like, what's going on with him? And you know what would the the Smith family, Will and Jada, you know, um, their daughter Willow, she took a picture with some actor. Some it was a young actor. He had his shirt off. It wasn't sexual. I don't know if they did like an artistic picture. She was laying on the side of a bed, and you know, child services are investigating Will Smith and Jada right now. Child Protective um, Services they're investigating them. That's deep. That's real deep. And it, I'm going to talk about Floyd Mayweather and T.I. in a minute. But my thing is, with child services investigating them, that's very interesting because do you know all the pedophilia and shit that goes on out here? They don't investigate them. So I can't co-sign them doing that. There are so many cases of pedophilia in the industry. So really, they're going to make a try to make an example out of Will and Jada. I, I'm not really feeling that. Not really feeling that. Because they've always do these, they've always done these little investigations on black celebrities, but man, there's all types of stuff that go on. Go look up this interview by um, Corey Feldman. He did on um, 2020, talking about all the people in, these people in Hollywood who molested him and all this old shit. Dude, you don't even know out here, the pedophilia? Dude. Man, with Roman Polanski, how these people were protecting Roman Polanski, and now they want to investigate Will and Jada. I ain't feeling that. Not feeling that. Oh, Ted Nugent. Exactly. Pedophile-ass Ted Nugent. 
Yeah, again, they they're trying to send Will a message. It's like, yeah, we you nice and all that old good stuff, but we can still get at you if we want to. So that I'm not feeling that at all. All the shit that goes on out here, they're gonna investigate them. Not feeling that. The way they did our brother Michael. The way they did Michael, real raggedy. And that's why I wasn't really feeling that hologram. I know a lot of folks like that whole hologram thing. I mean, technically and theatrically, as far as the technology, it looked great. But I'm not feeling that whole hologram shit. I'm just not. I'm not feeling it. Oh, don't, don't even get me started on Woody Allen. They, they never investigated Woody, Woody Allen. No, the... Oh, the list goes on and on. They're going to investigate our brother, but not, man, the list goes on and on. And, but that whole hologram thing, I, I wasn't really feeling it because, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not feeling that whole hologram thing. Uh, this whole, now you want to pay tribute to our brother. After he's gone, you shitted on our brother when he was alive. Now you want to bring his hologram out. You know what? To me, it's like, look, we got to pay him too much money while he's here. I mean, they went in on Michael when he was here. They were shitting on this brother. Now, like, we, we're going to kill you, and we're going to still make money off you. We'll just make money off your hologram. Just get you up out of here because you, you want too much money. You own all our publishing. You, you, you got to go. But we'll make this money off your hologram. So I'm not feeling that too much. I'm just not feeling the whole fake love behind it because I don't like the way they treated the brother in real life. So I, I'm, I might be the odd man out. I just don't want to. I'm not feeling that. And, that, and they're going to do a hologram tour. Trust me on that. They're just testing shit out and, and slowly getting it in, getting you used to these holograms. Now, the Tupac hologram, the reason I could rock with that because Dre and Snoop work with Tupac. So I can work, I can rock with that for a minute. Dre and Snoop actually work with Tupac. So I can rock with that. Michael didn't like none of these damn executives. Michael didn't like these executives. When I see people like Tommy Mottola and all these dudes doing interviews, Michael couldn't stand these fucking dudes. Michael couldn't stand these dudes, man. Michael did not like these dudes. Michael was shitting on them before he died. Go look at some of those interviews. I played them on my show. Michael was shitting on these dudes before he died. Michael was giving their asses that work. So uh, the whole hologram thing, what they're going to do, they're going to take a hologram on tour. They're going to, trust me, I, I'm telling y'all already, they're going to do a whole hologram tour with that whole technology. They're going to do a whole concert with it, probably up in Vegas somewhere. They're going to do a whole Michael Jackson hologram concert up in Vegas. So I wasn't really feeling that. They're going to make money off the brother when he's gone. You're going to get him up out of here and still make money off of him. So now you ain't got to pay him. You ain't got to pay the family. You ain't got to pay the estate. The family's in shambles. That daughter, Paris, craziest cat shit. She, they got her in like a home somewhere in Utah. She's trying to get with her birth mother, Debbie Rowe. Debbie Rowe ain't even supposed to be seeing the girl. They done all types of slick shit. That's Michael, it was, Michael didn't trust some, but he trusted others. It was a lot of these motherfuckers he shouldn't have been trusting, to be honest. Because Debbie Rowe, I don't know if she's going to try to get custody of the kid. They, uh, Debbie Rowe ain't even supposed to be acknowledging the damn kid. But I, hey, all that shit is weird. Yeah, I think, didn't Janet smack her upside the fucking head or something? You know, when Janet laying hand on 
Janet's the sweetest person in the world, but if Janet got to lay hands on you, yeah, that Paris, oh, Lord, she was a problem child. Already knowing the knowledge. No, I, I knew a lot of the stuff that was in Hidden Colors already. I already knew a lot of stuff. Yeah, I heard she tried to kill herself. So, you know, she's going through some things. And she's a kid. And I don't want to, you know, try to disparage her for, for going through what she's going through. I mean, she's living a troubled life. But, you know, it's real heavy. But we got to talk about T.I. and Floyd Mayweather. T.I. and Floyd Mayweather got into it was it yesterday or last night? What happened was this. Tiny, who's been knowing Floyd Mayweather for a while, I don't know, T.I. and Tiny, they're going through their thing. A few weeks ago, like, now Tiny's, like, she's been hanging out with Floyd Mayweather as friends, but Tiny, Tiny is putting up, like, pictures of her and Floyd Mayweather. And Tiny, I think Tiny's saying, like, a lot of little slick stuff. Like, Tiny says something, and I, I'm, I'm going to put it on Tiny for a minute. Tiny did an Instagram picture at Floyd Mayweather's house. It was a whole bunch of people at Floyd Mayweather's house. It was like Lisa Ray, a whole bunch of people. It was a big party, so she took a picture with him. And in the Instagram caption, it was like, it's good to be around winners. It was something she said. I'm like, oh, if, if, if that's my wife taking pictures with dudes talking about I love being around winners. I don't know. It just kind of sounded weird coming from a married chick. Hold on. Wait. Oh, somebody's crying upstairs. Hold on. Oh, that's my nephew crying. My nephew, ma'am. My nephew, I gotta stop. There's some so much. That's I told y'all about my nephew before. I took him to see Kung Fu Panda. He was crying. I, my nephew, I gotta stop him from doing a little moist stuff. My nephew be doing some moist stuff. <laughs> he's up there crying. He's like seven now, and I gotta stop him sometimes. What well, he was um. I came downstairs because they stand with me on the weekend for Memorial Day weekend. And I, I come downstairs. He's on the damn sofa watching cartoons, like laying on his stomach with his booty tooted up. I'm like, man, if you don't sit your ass down right, why, uncle? I said, dude, you don't sit with your booty tooted up like that. <laughs> dude, you don't do that, my dude. I said, he's like, I'm comfortable. I said, that just don't look right, man. <laughs> it just don't look right, dude. I got to holler at him. You, you dig? You just don't be laying up on the sofa looking like that, you know? <laughs> so you used to do that beautiful breath. <laughs> you a girl, though. I said, okay, we're going to have to go down and toss this basketball around a little bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he needs, yeah, you know, <laughs> he needs some training. <laughs> yeah, so he, we, he got to, we got to get into some sports activity. We got to do some athletics a little bit. Yeah, he didn't know why it wasn't cool to be laying on your stomach with your, your ass in the air looking at goddamn blues clues. Like, that ain't cool, fam. You don't have to sit right. Peanut! Oh, she can't come in and lock the door. Okay, anyway, but like I was saying, I was talking about T.I. and Tiny. So... I think T Tiny posted some pictures of Floyd Mayweather, and it was innocent. You know, it was innocent, but I think Tiny was, like, saying little, kind of little slick stuff, I'm thinking. So, 
T.I. was in New York, and they got a little bit of this, uh, this on video. He saw Floyd Mayweather up at a jewelry store, and he was like, hey, Floyd, let's go outside. I need to talk to you. And he was talking to Floyd about, hey, man, you know, I think, you know, Tiny might be trying to play us, play dudes against each other and all that. And, you know, Floyd was like, hey, you know, Tiny's my friend. I'm not, ain't nothing happening with me and Tiny, bro, you know. It ain't nothing happening. You know, that's the that's friend. She came to a party, whatever. And I'm just going by what Floyd said. Because I think Floyd just did an interview about that. So, fast forward a, a couple of weeks later. They're Tiny and Chicana and all those guys. They're up in Vegas. And I think they, were, they ran into Floyd again. And they were hanging out with Floyd. Putting up pictures on Instagram. So, T.I. saw Floyd, like, I think last night at Fat Burgers. And, like, went into... Went in there like, hey, Floyd, I need to talk to you outside again. And Floyd was like, look, man, get the fuck out of here. Now, I feel Floyd on that now. No, I don't think Floyd is messy. I feel Floyd because T.I. was like, hey, man, let me holler at you. And I'm like, I'm not going to keep talking to a dude about his lady. You know, and I, and I feel Floyd, and I'm going to say, and I'm not like T.I. I think T.I. was in the wrong for hollering at Floyd. T.I., you're wrong for hollering at Floyd. T.I., you're in the wrong for hollering at Floyd. And from what I understand, I think Floyd Mayweather's bodyguards put, put them things on T.I. I think they put them things on T.I. But Floyd was like, hey, nigga, check your bitch. You know, Floyd kind of went off a little bit. And then Floyd apologized. He's like, you know what? I shouldn't have said that because, you know, you know, Tiny's cool. She's good people. You know, I ain't, she never done nothing wrong to me. But T.I. T.I. should not have done that. You never, you shouldn't have stepped to Floyd like that. Yeah, T.I., you shouldn't have stepped to Floyd because that's on your lady, man. That's on your lady. Your lady is saying she's putting up pictures on Instagram, making little slick comments, and, T and Tiny need to chill out with that, too, because that's a bad look, Tiny. What did she say? There's something I saw. I'm trying to remember the exact wording of it. It was something about, I like being around winner. It's, it feels so good to be around a winner. Some shit she said that was, she made it seem like it was innocent, but it was kind of inappropriate for a married chick. I feel T.I. on that. I feel T.I. where he's coming from, but he he he's directing his energy to the wrong people. You got to holler at your lady. Got to holler at your lady, my dude. Got to holler at your lady. Yeah, and the pictures are online, and I feel them, though, because if your lady, you know, your lady taking pictures with dudes, any, for, you know, for example, shit, if my lady's in a picture with a dude, period, I'm, unless it's a relative, I would kind of feel a certain way. I don't want my lady all hugged up with niggas like that, you know, and then making little comments like, it feels so good to be around, you know, what, come on, Tiny, what you, you know, come on, you out of pocket. Tiny is out of pocket. But that whole Ice-T Coco thing, I think that was a publicity stunt. I think that was a whole publicity stunt. You upset? Hey, man. What's up, Tariq? Man, wait till you see Hidden Colors 3, man. Hidden Colors 3 is going to be in theaters June 26th in select um, cities. It's going to be in um, Washington, D.C. It's going to be at two theaters in D.C. It's going to be in Atlanta, Chicago, L.A., Oakland, Dallas, Philly, and New York. So it's going to be on and popping. But I think Tiny was out of pocket with that whole T.I. situation. Tiny was out of pocket. And I don't know what they're going through. But, you know, Tiny's out here, you know. She might be feeling herself a little bit. You know, she's like, you know, I'm back in the spotlight now. You know, I'm out here doing me. Yeah, Chris Brown is still locked up. Let's get, I want some ladies to call up. Oh, yeah, it is going to be in Detroit. I'm sorry, I forgot. I always forget about Detroit for some reason. I forgot. It is going to be in Detroit that Thursday, too. It's going to be in Detroit as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have everything listed on the website. We're just trying to get everything 
and the times confirm. Because sometimes in one spot is going to be at 8 o'clock. So we're going to have all the times and the addresses and everything for you on the website pretty soon. And that's at HiddenColorsFilm.com. Yes, the DVD will be soon after that. What's up? Who's calling? Hey, what's up, Tyreek? It's Jones. Jones? Where are you calling from, Jones? Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Hey, right, there you go. What's on your mind, Jones? Yeah, no, I just want to talk about that T.I. situation, um, T.I. Floyd. I, you know, about a couple of, like, podcasts ago, you say how tricks are winning and they're getting their own reality show. I, that's, I think that's a perfect example when you give a... You give a trick too much, you know, stability, and, you know, what you think? Yeah, and to a certain degree, a lot of times, man, um, you know, you, you put somebody in the spotlight, they start feeling themselves, and, you know, they start feeling a certain way and start acting a certain way. But, hey, you know, you got to be secure enough to be able to deal with that, and you got to be secure enough also to charge into the game if they start feeling themselves a little bit too much. Yeah. You did? 